No, I don't want you to panic. Just lean back and relax. Hello, I'm John J. Thompson, and welcome to another special edition of the True Tunes podcast, From the Vault. From time to time, we dig through the archives and find things that just have to be heard. And on this episode, we feature one of the most powerful vocalists of the 80s. His songs pushed deep into the human experience and then sprang back as epic alt-rock anthems. His band then delivered those songs to within an inch of their lives. Yes, I'm talking about none other than Michael Bean and The Call. They blew the horns and the walls came down. They all the horns and the walls came down. They stood there. I found the cassette copy of an interview I conducted with Bean in 1994, around the time of the release of his lone solo album On the Verge of a Nervous Breakthrough. And while I am terribly embarrassed by my own interview skills back then, what Bean had to say was just too good to keep under a bushel any longer. So, as we crack open the vault this time, we will hear Michael Bean, in his own Oklahoma accent, being incredibly patient with an eager young fan. We'll also survey the music of the call from their very beginning in the early 80s right through to their final curtain and beyond. We've gathered some excellent rarities by the band and, well, we're going to take you on a heck of a ride. If you're already a fan of the band, brace yourself. If this is new to you, prepare to have your heart and mind blown wide open by a band that defied categorization and did it all for the chance to tell a tale and for love. And we'll let it all begin right after we take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Vision Trust is a relatively small organization that has developed a particularly effective way of changing the world for one child at a time. Instead of moving into countries and setting up shop as if they have all the answers, the folks at Vision Trust find local programs run by local, we call them heroes, who are committed to the physical, emotional, material, and spiritual care of children in their community. These are people who have demonstrated success. They know what they are doing and they know their community. What they need is money. Vision Trust has developed a program through which you can sponsor a child and for just $40 a month, think $10 a week, that kid's life is changed. You can write to your sponsored child and you'll probably hear back. We sponsor a little boy named Angel in Peru, for instance, and hopefully, maybe as soon as later this year, we're going to travel down there to Peru to do some work in Angel's community. Who knows, maybe you'd like to come with us and help. It would really mean a lot to me if you would take 10 minutes or less, go to visiontrust.org slash true tunes and sponsor a child with us. Our family has been sponsoring children for years and years. It's some of the best money we have ever invested in anything. Would you join us? visiontrust.org slash true tunes or you can find the link on the show notes page at truetunes.com and if you do sponsor a kid please drop me a line and let me know thanks before we roll the tape which we have done our best to restore but is still a 28 year old cassette recorded on a phone line with one of those radio shack suction cup microphones i want to set the stage a bit especially for the benefit of anyone who might not be familiar with Michael Bean or The Call. Maybe you know the hits, I still believe, Let the Day Begin, or The Walls Came Down, but your familiarity drops off at that point. To many people, The Call was another one or two hit wonder band of the 80s, who got some songs and some movies and on AOR radio and made a nice dent, but never really broke through. But to others, myself included, they were a critical piece of our creative, communal, spiritual journey. The Call formed in Santa Cruz, California in 1980, and their debut self-titled album, which was recorded in England, was released by Mercury Records in 1982. Their muscular music blended elements of new wave, classic rock, and even touches of old-school 60s garage rock, 
But what really set them apart was Bean's emotive baritone vocal and songs that dared to make empathy sound tough. Well, it only took a moment for the cages to explode. I say it must be released from corruption of the soul at all. Have you heard the latest cry? Yeah, we've heard it all before. A weapon falls from the sky. Yeah, we've seen it all before. Buildings living, people die. Where we but as barbed as Bean's lyrics were when aimed at corrupt leaders and the foul spirit of the age, there could always be heard an abundance of compassion for the common man caught in the crossfire. And between the grooves, there was a spiritual angle through which rare beams of light filtered. They became known, in the same way as artists like Bruce Coburn, T-Bone Burnett, U2, and others, as a group with a Christian perspective on the human condition that they were willing to explore. And the band, well, the musicians who made up the call were uniquely suited to each other. It took a hell of a unit to stand up to Bean's almost overpoweringly earnest voice. Whether whispering or wailing, Bean channeled the power of a Pentecostal preacher and the swagger of an opera singer. In addition to vocal duties, he also played guitar before shifting to bass against Scott Music's imaginative Rolling Thunder drums. Tom Ferrier blended a wide array of styles and tones into his guitar playing. Keyboardist Jim Goodwin joined in 83 and went the distance with the band. That core unit, Michael Bean, Tom Ferrier, Scott Music, and Jim Goodwin, became one of the most important early alternative bands of the 80s. In many ways, they were America's answer to U2, Simple Minds, and the other big music bands of the era. Peter Gabriel became such a fan of the call, he dubbed them the, quote, future of American music, and took them out as the support act on his Plays Live tour in 82 and 83. Gabriel's relationship with the call, and Michael Bean in particular, continued for years. A breakthrough seemed inevitable. This is your life, this is your world, beginning to end. This is the price of heaven on hope. This is the time, this is your life. We'll come back to our musical survey of The Call in a bit, but it's time to roll the tape. As I mentioned, I had an opportunity to interview Michael Bean in 1994 via telephone for a story intended to appear in the print magazine I published at the time, True Tunes News. Like the interviews on our Rich Mullins and Larry Norman specials, no one but Bruce and I have heard this tape until now. I was 24 years old in 1994 and still a very inexperienced interviewer. There is a lot for me to cringe at here. But alas, I humble myself for your sake. A million stars were circling In the world above my head As I drifted back in memory To all the things we said And turning my attention To the pain that I denied It was never my intention To ever say first group of things I was going to ask you about was sort of the musical direction of it. I wondered what were some of the main differences in uh, putting this together as opposed to the many, many years you were with The Call? Well, we stopped. Uh, the last Call show was on, it was on New Year's Eve of 1990. And right after that, and, and Jim Goodwin our keyboard player was leaving, was leaving the band because he got married and his wife didn't want him to tour and he wanted to raise a family. And I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do. Um, I did a few other things. I did a soundtrack of a movie during that year of 91. I just started writing on my own and I really didn't see, I didn't see Scott or Tom, the other guys in the college see him like, you know, once or twice a year. And so I was really writing 
on my own before I had written much in much more closer proximity with the band I'd write a song write a couple of songs and we'd we'd get together and rehearse them and flush them out and see what they were going to sound like with this this was all done pretty much on my own I was demoing them up on my own on a you know on a four track with uh drum machine and that kind of stuff and playing all the instruments and I had much more definite idea of what I wanted what I wanted it to sound like and I made a few of these tapes up and sent them to the record company and to other people and the, the unanimous reaction was uh, this doesn't sound like the call <laughs> I mean other than my voice and they even said you're singing different so I decided rather than have to live up to some and, and some people their reaction was negative because it didn't sound like the call other people was positive because it didn't sound like the call it was something new and different so I decided rather than just have to carry expectations for good or for bad you know I'd just try something new I noticed that the the two remaining members of the call have a strong presence musically on the record but uh, were they were they uh, totally fine with the new arrangement well it was I don't really know. They were, they, 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 I think they're more into it on a song level. You know, if they like the songs and like playing on them, fine. The rest of it is rather, I mean, we, you know, it would have been nice to keep the call together. And I guess on some level, we kind of still are. I mean, I don't, I, we haven't like said we'll never play together. There wasn't any kind of bad feeling. So I don't really know. I just wanted the latitude that if I wanted to play with other players, I could. If I wanted to change the sound of the band, I could. Tom played on about half of the record and I wanted to play more guitar, you know, and, and this is the only way to do it without like saying, well, you only get to play on half the songs on this call record. And I wanted to, there was a, a use, a couple of the guy, a couple of other musicians, you know, played on a different guitar players. And I used a different bass player and drummer on a couple of songs. And, you know, I just wanted to be able to do that, you know, have the freedom to do that. What happened with Red Moon? It seemed like it was released and it disappeared right away, was it? Well, we we kind of got it into our minds that we were going to do another kind of music, which which at that time was incredibly unpopular, <laughs> which now is becoming kind of popular. But uh, we, you know, we we wanted to make almost a tribute album to like Van Morrison and Bob Dylan and Neil Young and the band and people like that that we'd liked when we were you know in elementary school and so we did that and, and of course it wasn't at all what was happening at that time grunge and heavy stuff was coming in at the time we wanted to make one of those kind of records and the mca the label just freaked when we gave it to them. You know, there's no market for this at all plus we were also coming off of a weird stepchild situation with a record company because when we had signed to mca the guy who signed us was irving azoff and he was the he he ran that company completely, and uh, you know he really liked the group and loved the stuff. And uh, we we signed to the label, and uh, this when, with Let the Day begin. We signed to the label and right after we signed. He left <laughs> to have to have Giant. He's the president of Giant Records, and so the guy that came in and took his place, a guy named Al Teller didn't like the call at all never did he had come, he had come from uh, Columbia uh -huh. Tyler was with Columbia for years and he came in as president of MCA and Al Teller was w one of the guys at Columbia over the years like when when we would like be, be shopping a tape to get a record deal as the call we would always get rejected by Al Teller at Columbia and so now we're all of a sudden his band that he has to take on and he didn't like us a bit you know? so it, it does get down to things like that you know? did you even tour for that record yeah i think we went out for a couple of months you know? okay but you think the possibility of the call doing something together is at least there and that's not totally a, a i don't think it's out of the question no you know i i just want to be able to keep my options open i i just uh i don't want to have to do something that uh, musically I, I wouldn't be into at a particular time. Do you feel that your uh, 
sort of your motives or your uh, I hate the word role but sort of what you're trying to accomplish with your music has changed over the years since Seen Beyond Dreams and Modern Romans through the, the 80s and then to your solo stuff do you feel like you uh, like a changing of of uh, orientation there or is it, has it always been just to write music well, it's always been to write music. There was a time, I think, in the early 80s, like with Modern Romans, where there was a definite political thing happening. And just, I was in shock because of Ronald Reagan, I think, and I, <laughs> in my mid-20s, and I was just kind of railing against the the horror of him being president and what that was going to do to the country. And uh, But after writing a few songs that I thought, you know, that were rather political, I started being more interested in, uh, rather than global corruption or, yeah, rather than like a global corruption, I started getting interested in a personal kind of corruption of what is it that makes people be so prone to war and violence and just all the emotion. So it took me kind of inside rather than, you know, internal instead of external kind of examination of life, you know. And that has been, and it stayed that way. I'm still trying to do that. There's a lot of soul searching on this stuff. Is Would you say that the majority of these songs are, are very first person about your experiences, or do you try to write sort of a, about fictional characters? So there's a lot of different dynamics on that stuff. Is it all pretty personal, or is it sort of figurative? I think it's both. I think it's both. I don't. It isn't. It isn't strictly autobiographical. That's for sure. It would be more. Some of it is. Some of it isn't. It. It, it also might be a bit of it. Of I think I would think of a particular situation that someone might be in, either myself or somebody else. And if it was a situation that I'm not in or presently in, uh, if I put myself into that situation just trying to trying to figure out how I might react in that situation or how that might feel, you know. We're going to pause the tape for a few minutes and revisit our exploration of the music of the call after a bit of housekeeping. So stay tuned. Hello, my name's Rob and I'm one of the Patreon backers of the True Tunes podcast. I'm honored to invite you to join me in support of True Tunes by signing up on their email list. I know email is often annoying, but by being on the list, I get notified when new episodes drop and when new articles get posted at truetunes.com. Sometimes, John even sends out short notes and gives away records and swag and stuff. Super cool. But really, the point is that by staying directly connected, I know that they don't have to pay Facebook or anyone else in order for me to hear from them, and that's important. They don't send out too many emails either, and I'm always happy to get them. So really, it would be helpful if you'd join me over here. You can find the sign-up link on the front page at truetunes.com. Oh, and don't forget to add John's email address, jjt at truetunes.com, to your contacts so that the emails don't get caught in your spam filter. And if you have any feedback on the show or questions, you can email him and he'll get back to you eventually. Thanks for listening. The Call followed their underappreciated debut with a true barn burner. Modern Romans, produced by Bean and the band, was a leaner, more taut affair, which drew direct contrast between the espoused values and actions of Christian America. The biblical references were even more pronounced, and a radical Christian worldview hung over the songs like Spirits in an Old House. Bean tackled politics, both governmental and interpersonal, from an unflinchingly Christ-haunted viewpoint. Sanctuary fades, congregation split. The Walls Came Down is a good indication of the sound and perspective of the entire album, with the title track and Turn a Blind Eye being others I think of often. But especially in light of how things have proceeded since it was made 40 years ago, 
Modern Romans stands as a prescient, powerful warning that too few believers heeded. To the desperate young, turn a blind eye. To the old and lonely, turn a blind eye. To our inhumanity. To our death-dealing vanity. To the methods of persuasion, turn a blind eye. Masters of evasion, turn to the science of control. Turn a blind eye to a world in change. The band softened their edges a bit, in some ways at least, when they released Seen Beyond Dreams one year later, leaning harder into the synth bed sounds that dominated radio in those days, and taking an even more openly spiritual approach to their lyrics. Beneath the shimmering surface, Bean was digging deeper into his own personal reservoir of spiritual struggles, questions, and revelations. In a 1987 interview that I will link to on the show notes page, Bean refers to Seen Beyond Dreams as their metaphysical album and admits that many personal tragedies and changes in the band's lineup contributed to the shift in sound. It is quite a profound demonstration of an artist working hard to allow his faith to inform his art in ways that make it more, and not less, resonant to his audience. The band was released from their contract with Mercury after Seen Beyond Dreams, and it took them some time to work out the details of a new deal with Elektra Records. But when their fourth album dropped in 1986, it was clear that the call was just hitting their stride. Reconciled brought to full flower all of the seeds that had been planted on the first three albums. The Sonics were huge, the performances airtight, and it sounded as if The Call was the biggest band, or at least the band with the biggest heart, in America. And while none of the singles even made a dent on the pop charts, several could be heard on college and AOR stations, and an underground fan base, including an increasing number of Christian listeners, rallied to their cause. Raise me. The record opens with Everywhere I Go, as it recognizes God's hand, goodness, and guidance in all things with rollicking determination and gusto. The gospel energy was more obvious, more personal, as Bean focused his attention on what he called internal politics, seeming to recognize that the peace he and we were hungry for in the world would only happen if we as individuals could work to reconcile our hearts with the profound love that has called us out of the dark. As the strains of Everywhere I Go faded out like a prayer in the darkness, a plodding bass line lays down a new path, and we are pulled right back in to the most famous song from Reconciled, and considered by many to be one of the best songs of the 80s. There's just no way to overstate how powerful I Still Believe Great Design was when it first exploded in our ears. From those brooding opening notes to Bean's ecstatically, almost unhinged vocal in the bridge, it was simply electrifying. But I Still Believe was truly just the beginning. I've been in a cave for 40 days Only a spark to light my way I want to give out, I want to give in, 
This is our crime This is our sin But I still believe I still believe Through the pain And through the grief Through the lies Through the storms Through the cries And through the wars Oh, I still believe Reconciled was crammed full of epic moments, chill-inducing performances, and lyricism that would absolutely set a bar for all future comers. Guest appearances from Peter Gabriel, Robbie Robertson, and Simple Minds' Jim Kerr would have overshadowed most other bands, but here they feel organic and authentic. Overall, Reconciled sits up there with Gabriel's So, Midnight Oil's Diesel and Dust, U2's The Joshua Tree, and Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever as 80s classics that sound just as good and have just as much to say today as they did when they first came out. What happened to my life? What happened to me, girl? Unfortunately, though their songs have been covered, including an amazing version of I Still Believe by Russ Taff and a, well, weirder version by an oiled-up bodybuilder saxophonist named Tim Capello that was used in the film The Lost Boys, and despite the widespread critical acclaim, Reconciled failed to really take off the way most of us hoped it would. Still, its impact was undeniable, and fortunately, the band was not finished yet. But let's get back to some more of my conversation with Michael Bean right now. Roll it, Bruce. I think of you everywhere I go. I think of you everywhere I go. I look for you everywhere I go. I must have you everywhere I go. Smiles, eyes, powers to confound me. I lose my nerve. Your voice, it echoes all around me. I think of you everywhere I go. I think of you everywhere I go. I need you everywhere I go I must have you everywhere I Everywhere I go What do you feel about the interplay between your, your faith and the music at this point? Well... It's always it's always so evolving at the same time it's always so elusive. I I don't know how I feel about things <laughs> and that's kind of what how I write about it. I know when I did some of those records there were a lot of see, I don't know what my my particular thing is I'm not sure what Christianity means. I'm not really exactly sure what uh 
what spiritual means. It's a. I know that things, when you're younger and at a certain age, things seem really easy to, for me. Things were easy to define because there wasn't as much information. There wasn't as much experience, and so you take a limited amount of experience and a limited amount of information, and you can come up with a conclusion. For me, as you keep going and you have so many other kinds of experiences and things become so huge that you can no longer easily make a statement of this is who I am and this is what I believe and this is the truth. It becomes bigger than that, you know. And and I and it, for me, it's more the whole thing is uh, pretty overwhelming. It's all extremely overwhelming. And I see, I don't know what Christian, I don't know what Christian means really. I know, I have a, a feeling about it. Um, you know, I have a feeling that that there's a that there's a truth in there. I'm not exactly sure what that truth is for me. I know what it is as far as the the uh, the club goes. I know what the statement of you know of the of the group is. Although they all although all the you know the group totally disagrees with each other. But I'm trying to. It, it has more to do with what is it, what does it mean to me, and I'm not sure what it means to me. You know, I tend to lean that way. But at the same time, I don't seem to have too much in common with other people that lean that way. Are there any absolutes that you can hang your hat on, or is it all, is every facet of quote-unquote Christianity uh, that sort of elusive, uh, ever-changing, or never quite sure? I mean, like, are there any hooks, anything that you feel solid about? Well... I guess there's one thing I feel solid about, and that's that if it isn't true, then I think we're then I think I'm screwed, <laughs> <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's the way I kind of look at it. So it all has to. Be, I hope that it's true. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I. Uh, when you say it's, are you referring to like the Bible, or are you referring to the general? Well, no. The Bible is a uh, is this brilliant work of genius that uh, I don't pretend to know what the hell it means because <laughs> I'm not that smart. I know it's a riddle. I know it doesn't have. To, I know it has very little to do with the the literal facts and adjectives that are that, and stories the literal meaning of the stories I think it has much more to do with the moral of the story and the riddle of the of the story I don't think it has to do with you know hang out your yellow laundry on Tuesday and on Wednesday just wash blues you know I, I don't think it has anything to do with that and to me that's what most Christianity the way it's acted out by most people to me that's what it boils down to um I do have a sense of uh of need for something transcendental <clears throat> and and I hope that the basic thing of of love and you know the, the basic tenets of it of understanding and of uh, of this overwhelming love by some transcendent power my particular experience being in America and being raised in this country of you know, it 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 is it, 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 it's Christianity. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I think God comes to us. You know, if you believe in God, you know, I think He comes to us. However, whatever way we'll take Him in, and if you're a Buddhist and that's the way you take Him in, He'll gladly come in 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 that in that form. And if He comes in as Jesus, or if He or if He comes in just as God, or if He comes in as the worship of the of the moon and the wind and the sun, he will adapt to the weakness of humans, you know. Um, I tend to lean toward the uh, the Christ story more than I lean toward any of those other other beings, you know, transcendent beings, because it seems to be much more rooted in the blood and guts of life rather than the, the attainment and a spiritual kind of enlightenment.
but I'm not sure about it because it seems for me for me to say this is this and this is this and this is what this means and this is what this is and this is what I believe in I'm just uh it would it would be kind of an arrogant statement for me to make because I'm not sure about any of it. Like I said, I hope that it's true. I hope the basic thing is true because I tend I understand the I the need in my own life, and if I'm bold enough to make judgments on other people's life or on humanity in general, it looks like we absolutely need this thing <laughs> that that is promised uh in the in the christian story and so i kind of i hope it's true if it isn't true you know i think we've had it <laughs> i know i think i've had it <laughs> if, you know if if there you know it's like this if there isn't a god well then it don't matter if there is a god and it's all based on on works or on your own particular ability to come to to come to some kind of uh, deserving of heaven or deserving of of whatever promise there might be. Well, then I think I'm screwed. And if, but if uh, if there is something that is a that is a, a gift, if there is a gift, if there is grace. I'm hoping that's the truth because I think uh, I think it's my only chance. <laughs> and most people that I observe and the way I, the, you know when you hear about the world and the things that we do to each other, I hope that something uh, if it isn't Christ, if it isn't Jesus, I hope it's something very similar. That's kind of what I think. Now, did I hear correctly that your wife is a minister? My wife is a therap is a is a therapist. She has a degree in in psychology, and uh, she has a th and she has a degree in theology because she she wanted the the secular psychiatry to have a spiritual element to it, and so she did get a theological degree. Oh, but she's not a priest or a minister I don't know where I, I she read can, that she can be but she right. doesn't function as one oh, okay. so it, make for what, what they have too. done is people she has worked for churches before as a as kind of an interim pastor therapist what they do is they'll send her to churches that have just lost their pastor for whatever reason, you know, he either absconded with the funds or he was having an affair with the secretary or things like that. They send they send her to churches that are uh, have been uh, wrecked emotionally, and she'll go in and like uh, do therapeutic work of trying to get the church healthy again before they bring in a pastor. And there doesn't seem to be any uh, any lack of work <laughs> yeah that's for sure <laughs> with your new record and uh, you have a pretty extensive tour coming out right oh it's about eight weeks or something like that are, are you planning on doing anything differently in terms of the whole road process all that remains the same you know you you go out there and you continue pushing trying to get your music heard more than the other guy Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what it, that's what it's about. You know, you're vying for that spot on the on the chart that everyone else is vying for. It's pretty much what it is. You go on the road and you you do interviews and you visit radio stations and you talk with retailers. It's it, it's very much a for me, and it always was. It's very much a business thing. You know, I mean, I, I would lose my mind if I didn't think that. After doing all that and traveling, you know, four or five, six hours a day, at the end of it, the reward is you get to get, you get to go play. You know, right. it's a heavy payment that you make for doing it. The other guys that tend to have it easier, they just kind of sleep, and I got to get up and go to a few radio stations and do some interviews and all that. And I enjoy. I I don't mind doing it. You know, I don't yeah. like to sleep that much, so it's okay. There is a video that you did for this record, right? 
Yeah, we did a video for the song Us. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's the first single. Is that doing pretty well so far? The single keeps building slowly. You know, I'm kind of starting over again. You know, I mean, right. when you come out as a solo thing, you know, I mean, many a lot of people, you know, because radio has changed so much and it's all a whole young group of people. Most of them have heard of the call, but they don't know who who I am. And so it's kind of, they have to kind of be re, you know, reintroduced. And in some cities it's doing fantastic. In other cities we're having a, a struggle for it. That's why we're going out on tour to try to get people to actually hear it and be aware that it's out and available. But I care about love And I care about truth And I care about trust And I care about you And I care about us We're going to pause the tape for a few minutes and revisit our exploration of the music of the call after a bit of housekeeping. So stay tuned. Hey, this is Ray, and I'm a Patreon supporter of the True Tunes podcast. If you want to join me and the other supporters of this show, you can start with a monthly donation of $5, $10, or $20, which helps to cover the cost of producing and hosting the show. As a thanks for our support, we get early access to episodes and high-quality, lossless wave files of each episode that we can download. We also have occasional Zoom meetups, some special live streams, discounts on True Tunes swag, and more. You can join me by visiting patreon.com slash truetunes or finding the link on the show notes page. If an ongoing patronage thing is not the right fit for you, but you'd like to give us a tip to help with the cost associated with this show, you can find links for that on the show notes page. Thanks, and now back to the music. As much as I loved Reconciled, I was not prepared for 1987's Into the Woods. Where Reconciled brought our fists into the air, Into the Woods brought us to our knees. The album fades in, cinematically, as if these thoughts have been ruminating for years already. I ain't here to hold you when you cry. I ain't here to hold your shaking hand. I ain't here to look you in the eye. I beg for you to understand. I ain't gonna walk you through your dreams Walk you through this life that we all know I ain't here to listen while you speak I ain't here to heal your broken soul Am I here at all? I Don't Wanna makes for a surprise opening salvo with a full minute long pre-launch, but by the time the song kicks in at the end of the first verse, it's clear that this is really a mission statement for the album we are about to hear. In the River is up next with one of the most badass openings in rock history. When I was quite young, I had learned to fear. I was 
taught to listen but not to hear From my mother's arms I was cruelly torn And they whipped my ass on the day I was born Little brother, he died With It Could Have Been Me, we really hear and feel the emotional thesis of Into the Woods. Bean does his best to walk in other men's shoes. Here again, we experience Bean's power as both a songwriter and as a vocalist. His performance is emotional and instructive, demanding empathy, without which the rest of this album will make no sense. Though the energy and intensity levels are high throughout the album, the tones are more subdued and the songs are more introspective on balance than reconciled. Memory, written from the perspective of the Apostle John after Jesus' death, shows us a biblical reflection of love and loss that is one of the most beautiful songs I have ever heard. closest we get to the kind of rafter shaking that was so common on Reconciled is probably Day or Night, but it was never even released as a single. The Walk Walk closes the set with a rockabilly prayer. This particular woodland journey has ended, but we are invited to sing this prayer along with Bean that we will avail ourselves of the companionship through the darkness offered by the Spirit.
Into the Woods wrecked me. It still does. When the band returned with Let the Day Begin, it seemed pretty clear that they were swinging for the fences this time. The album opened with another bass-first, riff-for-days intro, followed by music's now trademarked shuffle beat and Farrier's buzzsaw guitar. That song, a toast, blessing, or benediction, had everything we loved about the call in less than four minutes. Surrender would have been a Christian radio hit if Christian radio was not so committed to choir preaching, code reinforcement, and culture warring in 1989. So, for that matter, would For Love, a song inspired by Bean's involvement with Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ film, in which Bean portrayed the Apostle John. I went higher than I'd ever been before I went lower than the depths could hold I said a prayer that we found warning The figure rose up from the desert floor He looks at me, he says, how high are you? I look at him with my one good eye We just smile and stand in silence He did it all for a chance to die for love For love For love For love The closing track, Uncovered provides a bit of a bridge back to the sound and emotional space of Into the Woods. Over a simple keyboard track, Bean sings a gorgeous, almost operatic praise song in the tradition of Song of Solomon or Psalms. You awake my senses I was torn in doubt Losing all
As accessible as Let the Day Begin is, it's worth recognizing that the call did not have to sacrifice lyrical intensity, spiritual depth, or emotional impact to do it. There's not a cliché to be found, not a single cloying image or saccharine metaphor. In fact, it may be that with Let the Day Begin, the call perfected their own one-of-a-kind formula. This is your life, this is your world, beginning to end. This is the price of heaven or hope, this is the time, this is your life. It's hard to believe that The Call released so much great music in such a relatively short amount of time. Their final album of their initial run, Red Moon, came out just a bit more than a year after Let the Day Begin. It was a relaxed, though never lazy, collection of soulful, rootsy songs, many of them among the best in their catalog. I do believe you hold my soul in your hand I understand I see the world through your eyes Cause when it hurts, it really hurts And when we cry, everything corrals I'm gonna love you like you've never been loved I'm gonna kiss you like you've never been kissed I'm gonna hold you like you've never been held I'm gonna miss you like you the opening track, What's Happened to You, which included a guest vocal from Bono, signaled that we were going to experience another sonic and emotional shift with this set of songs. In contemplating the repercussions of a friend's sanctification, though they certainly would not have used that word to describe it, the song cleverly posits some excellent questions about how an encounter with God might impact a person. Used to hang your head down, you wouldn't look in my eyes. Did you see some great vision? Did you finally break through? Did you shake the foundations? What's happened to you? You were there through a blues soaked strut, considers Christ's promise to be present with, even represented by, the rejected, the lonely, the outcasts. Just seems pointless. Born I'm truly killed. Man, I am hopeless. I got diamonds. I got houses. I got silver clouds and silver spoons to match it. I've come up empty. Man, I am desperate. And I never wanna feel the warmth of summer come again. I'll be forgotten. As was the case with so much of the call's music, it balanced admonishment with mercy and conviction with counsel. And through it all, Michael Bean's voice. Red Moon would be the call's final studio album, for quite a while at least. We'll fill you in on Michael's solo project and the call in the 90s after the final segment of my conversation with him from 1994. <laughs> Is that soundtrack? That was for Light Sleeper, right? Right. Is that ever been released in the States? No, it was released in Europe. Was that an instrumental thing or was it? Oh. No, no. In fact, it was 
it's very much lyric. I mean, it's both. I did I did the the background music and all that for the movie, but there's about there's probably five actual songs or or pieces of songs to drive the the narrative line of the movie. It's a uh, it was unusual. It was an unusual use of of music. Like the main character, you know, he has his dialogue, and then he and another, and, and he also writes in a diary. But the music was supposed to be his uh, his unconscious voice, his subconscious voice, his thoughts and his feelings. Because he, in the movie, in this particular movie, he doesn't reveal. He's a very factual person. He tries to stay away from his feelings. And so the songs had to be the conveyance of that, that, that inner life, you know, so it was quite a challenge. Do you feel that your, that the spiritual search that goes on in your music, that sometimes that, how do you feel that interplays with the music industry? Is that something that the call was criticized for or praised for, or did that never even come up? Well, I think we were criticized for it and praised for it both by different by different groups of people or different journalists or whatever. And uh, the tough thing about it is uh, the intention for me was always to just get a little bit closer. If there is truth, you know, to get a little bit closer to it. And all in the music, the value of the music to me wasn't to like come out and make these statements or pontificate to people from on high of what they should and shouldn't be doing or, or believing. It always was a much more reasonable and practical uh, desire or ambition to make people get a little bit closer to that to the mystery of it all you know and if you can inspire someone to go well that's that might be an interesting thought and feeling to pursue maybe it will lead to something that to me was always a much more uh realistic goal than doing some supernatural cataclysmic conversion on somebody you know I don't I hate the I'd hate the responsibility of that <laughs> I don't uh, I don't know that I could do that you know you would hope that people would all you hope for is maybe just to you know make them like if they're you know if, if I'm speaking to myself too you know if I'm walking down the road and I'm going the wrong way I hope somebody gives me a word that says uh, it's over here Look down, look down, check out, check out this road. So the most you can ask for is if the road, you know, to me the road is 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 infinite. The walk is infinite. It goes, you know, it goes on forever. And to have the audacity to say, here, if you do this, I can guarantee you, you will be, a, you'll you'll reach the end of this road of this infinite road. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, I, I, I tend more to believe if you can help somebody that's w going down the wrong way or going a dead end or is walking backwards, the most you can ask of yourself or most you can ask of that other person is maybe inspire them to turn around, start walking the other way. What about when Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father, but through me, how, how does that uh, fit in? I don't have the easy answer to that. I would say, uh, what a mysterious thing to say. Uh, what an incredibly mysterious thing to say. That's, that is a, that's as big a statement as anyone could ever make. And, uh, that sounds like something that might take a lifetime to figure out what the hell he's talking about. Uh -huh. For one, I'd have to ask this. I'd have to say, if when he says I, right? Uh -huh. If he says I am the way, the truth, and the life, I'd have to start with the first word. I'd have to start with I. I'd have to say, who are you? You know? I mean, the way, the truth, and the light 
that doesn't really mean anything out of the context of I. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the word the way, that, that doesn't mean anything unless we're talking about a method. The truth, whew, the truth seems to be unbelievably complicated. And the life, I mean, that's the whole ball of wax. So I have to kind of go back and try to figure out, my first statement would be, well, who are you that you're making these kind of statements about yourself, you know? Have you come to any any ideas of, of that over the years, or is that still something that... Uh is that one of the reasons that you feel like it seems to be you know, it seems to be love you know yeah. I mean it seems to be it seems to be love it seems to get down to that and some of the in the, in the in the obvious the hopefully the things that that love entail we've all seen some incredibly bizarre uh, things done in the name of love we've seen some unbelievably cruel definitions of love so hopefully you see it seems to be about a relationship it's you know I mean I can it's trying to you know you have friends I'm sure and you if you're anything like me you know I can't figure them out <laughs> yeah I mean I can't figure I can't figure me out and I and and I got a better well I got a, I got a maybe a little bit better chance of figuring me out but I can't really figure them out very well and so if if the whole idea of, to me, the whole idea of Christianity would have to be in, would have to be relationship. So it's who you know. It's always who who are you? You know who is this person? What do you mean when you said that? You know, and we're if we're dealing with what Christianity espouses to be that this figure of Christ, this Jesus, is God. You know, I can't figure out. I can't figure out my friend who who's just a a guy who's going through all kinds of stuff and has all kinds of feelings. I can't figure out what in the world he's feeling and what he's doing and why he does the things he does. And so if I'm in a relationship with this being that says that he's God, I mean, what are my chances of understanding him where I could make these definite statements other than it, other than the other than it feels like love you know it feels like love it feels like understanding it feels like forgiveness it feels like all those those huge words yeah maybe that's where the coming as a child comes in because <laughs> it sounds like you know my son is 14 months old and he knows he loves me but he doesn't under, he doesn't know anything about me you know he he doesn't even know that I'm his father necessarily he, right you know, I feel I, I feel that way as a person uh -huh. I feel like for me to for me to say what this is all about would be like you know asking your child there to tell you you know for him to always you know at this at this point in his life to describe you I don't know how to do that I mean I can I can give you little echoes of kind of what it sounds like, yeah. <laughs> you know, bouncing off of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason I ask that is because this, uh, I think, I don't know, just strangely enough, this seems to sort of be almost a theme because in several of the other conversations we have in, in this issue, almost the same uh, ideas are coming up and what I'm finding personally as the, as the challenge there is that if, uh, if Christ's words, as quoted in the Bible, are in fact uh, accurate, you know, beyond any sort of denominational interpretation of them, it seems like there's, you know, there's sort of an absoluteism about it. You know, the, the, the hard part, I'm only 24, and I've been raised in a country where that great commission has become instead of go out and make disciples of all men it's become go out and make everybody look and behave just like you but i'm just now it seems like we're sort of getting down to the issue of okay well then what is it to be a disciple yeah. and it it just seems that maybe you know if if that was all true then 
and it also depends on how I'm interpreting what you've said, but it sort of puts a challenge to the idea that um, that Buddhism and uh, Hinduism or Shintoism or Taoism or or uh, Judaism or any other ism you could think of, <laughs> other than probably a fascism, would be uh, a valid. Uh, a valid means to sort of a positive end, you know, and that's the yeah. that's the challenge. So yeah, I think they absolutely are because I think that I think that God is all encompassing. You see, I think we're dealing with with a total with the total you know with the total reality of existence. Therefore, uh-huh. God, in fact, would be in all of those beliefs to one degree or another um the i don't think everybody i think i think people if god if god is a loving god it seems like everyone will get the information they need in order for them to come to come to god and some of us may absolutely need it presented specifically in the in the Christ story other people may need it presented in a, in another way but i would imagine that if you trust in god's communicative skills that those the, that the truth of it still gets through you know I can't imagine that somebody who lives in in the jungles of Ecuador is going to be re- rejected by God because he'd never heard of Jesus, you know, or he'd heard of him and and the way it was presented to him, he thought it was a bunch of crap because that particular missionary was a nut. So, so I don't know. I think we have to be way bigger about it and. I think the Great Commission. I think I think it's bigger than all that. You know, I, I don't think we can get so li- be so literal. I think we can be literal, but I don't think we can be so literalistic. And literalistic would mean to confine it to its literal meaning. You know what I mean? I think yeah, literally, it sure would be good to to present the idea of of Christ to the world. That can't be the only way to do it. That would be being literalistic. That would be being being that God exists right here in this in this book, and He doesn't He doesn't exist outside of this book, or He exists only within my particular interpretation of it, and He doesn't exist within your interpretation of it. I just think He's bigger and more wonderful than any of that. It seems then that you don't really feel any sort of mission with your music in terms of spreading any sort of ideas or in terms of uh, whether it would be about Christ or about uh, you know spirituality or or anything is that even playing or do you just try to sort of write from the gut at any given moment and see what happens I'm kind of looking you know is there a purpose there or is there is there a, do you see that as a role that you have or a, something that's you know that you're challenged to well, like do? I said I think I think I said before, I think the purpose is to is to say something that might inspire a person to turn around and walk the other way yeah. or to or to give them some kind of that if they're going down a dead end and at the end of that dead end, it's a dead end for them to for to maybe put it into their mind. Or hopefully inspire, inspire, see, inspire, inspiration, spiritual, they're all the same root word. So if you inspire somebody, give them a spiritual word that might make them say, whoa, this is, this is, this is, this is a dead end. I think I'll turn around here. That would be, that would be the mission. Huh. To me, it'd be like you know if 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 the if the Bible says feed the you know, feed the world, feed them all. What are you going to do? I mean, you going to are you going to take that? You going to take that literally that you're going to 
you're going to feed the world. I mean, I think what you sure can do is Jesus seemed to he seemed to feed people. <clears throat> he didn't go and tell everybody that he met, "Hey, I'm the man. Right. I'm the stuff. Believe in me. Get you know, follow me." He told some people specifically to follow him, and every whenever he, the one time I think that I'm aware of that he encountered the masses, he just fed them. And he gave them, and he, and he told them some incredibly uh, powerful statements. You know, blessed is this, blessed is that. Right. And to me, John, it's it's just huge. It's so big that it's it's there may be an absolute truth, right? Mm -hmm. But in my particular state of being, which is the human being in a human form. <clears throat> There's nothing absolute about my about my human form. Maybe my unconscious, subconscious, maybe my soul, maybe my spirit. Maybe there is, hopefully there's something absolute to it. But I'm not in contact with it consciously. I can only be a, a man. I can't be in the, in this in this body. I, I can only be a man. And I can hope that my soul and my spirit have the strongest influence on me. But uh, to start dealing with something absolute, I can only do in a state of hoping that I can even comprehend the word absolute. It does get much more down to faith and hope than it does to absolutes because you're making a contradiction in terms in many ways you know you're saying mm -hmm. I have faith I hope <laughs> that there's an absolute truth right <laughs> you know I mean you, well I for one appreciate your uh, your how, how many years has it been now uh, 15 years of of uh, raising the questions <laughs> I think it's, yeah it's well maybe mental well, thank you that's, uh, that's probably all I all I uh, have to offer. <laughs> uh, and some great music, too. <laughs> do you have any kids? Yeah, yeah. How many kids do you have? One, a boy. How old is he? He's 16. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had a child when I was 22. Oh, wow. That's great. Well, um, I'll send a package to you of some of our other issues because I'd like to get your uh, your feedback on it. Because what what I've been doing for the last few years is definitely uh, out of left field in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm not really aware too much of the Christian music scene. Uh, Dan Dan Russell is kind of been that conduit for me. Uh, right. I I met uh, I played on. Bruce, Jamie Owens? Bruce Coburn. Oh, Bruce, yeah. I played on a Bruce Coburn album, and I started listening to some of his stuff. I think he's really good. Oh, yeah. And I kind of knew, I mean, I met a few times and played on his record with a guy, Mark Hurd. I, oh, yeah. I thought some of his uh, some of his thoughts and his music were really extraordinary. Well, I usually don't... the. The only time I've ever seen Christian music stuff is when it's been on video or something like that. You know, when uh -huh. I'm on the road, they have, you know, you'll flash and think you're watching MTV and it's, it's some Christian video stuff. I haven't, you know, for me, I haven't been too impressed with it. Yeah. Musically, I find it to be, God, you know, it sounds like, it sounds like uh, they were all inspired by you know, Journey, <laughs> right, right, right? Richard Marx's band, or something. Yeah. And it's pretty, it's pretty square. There's a lot of good stuff that isn't commercial. It, I'll bet. All right. Well, thanks for talking to me, and I'll, uh, I'll be in touch, and I definitely will see you guys when you're in Chicago. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 And that's it for the interview. Again, I apologize for the poor audio quality. I also apologize for having had Michael Bean on the phone and neglecting to ask him about his literary references, the music that inspired him, how he cultivated his vocal style, or really anything else about the actual music. I was so fixated on his doctrine and completely ill-equipped to keep up with him on that level. Listening back, I deeply admire his patience with me and his willingness to keep responding. As you heard, the interview was recorded around the time of the release of Michael's solo record on the verge of a nervous breakthrough. 
That album featured bigger, more modern production, which was a major departure from the rootsy sound of Red Moon. But between Bean's voice and his consistently stellar lyricism, there was certainly enough of the old DNA to light us up. I can trust in you. With the exception of some film placements though, Nervous Breakthrough failed to break through. In 1997, Michael's then manager, Dan Russell, found a way to gather some of the most popular songs by The Call, add a couple of Bean solo songs, and present the best of The Call to the world through a joint distribution deal with Warner Brothers to both the mainstream and Christian music spaces. I remember seeing Michael briefly at one of the Gospel Music Week events in Nashville around then. He came to a midday luncheon to promote the album to the distribution company as well as retailers and radio programmers. I made my way over to him and said hi. He told me he had been trying to take it all in. What do you think? I cringed, assuring him that only about 10% of what was happening that day had anything to do with what True Tunes was about. He laughed. Well, he said, if bullshit were bullets, there'd be bodies piled to the ceiling. <laughs> I will never forget that. I went down where the road meets the sea And I took everything that I owned I was sitting on catastrophe We were also fortunate to have the call play an unplugged set at our club upstairs at True Tunes shortly after that. Unfortunately, we got hit by an epic blizzard that night. I think we got about 15 inches of snow during the show and only about 15 people showed up. I thought the band would cancel or maybe just do a couple of songs begrudgingly, but no. They played their full set, often talking to the handful in the crowd, taking requests, and thanking them for braving the weather. I was amazed, and I took notes. This band, who I had previously seen just a few years earlier at a sold-out show at the Metro in Chicago, was playing for those 15 people in Wheaton with dignity and grace. She felt so uninspired Never walked on air Never walked through fire She felt so undesired no one seemed to care couldn't get much higher she believes all your lies she believes love is blind she believes someday she I did one other in-person interview with Michael around the time of the release of The Call's 1997 album, To Heaven and Back, an excellent set that failed to get any traction beyond the band's most die-hard fans. 
And that was it for the call. The son you heard Michael mention in the interview, Robert LeVon Bean, formed an amazing rock band called Black Rebel Motorcycle Club a few years after this conversation. For my money, BRMC has been one of the best rock and roll bands of the last 20 years. Though completely different than The Call, they too dig deep into spiritual imagery to craft songs of resonance. This is stranger than love for us Turning backwards to face the dawning No excuse for a wasted life Lightly falling through a whisper of sky It's the weight of the world I know As I struggle to be Michael traveled with BRMC for years, running sound and acting as a sort of mentor to the members. Sadly, in 2010, Michael Bean died of a heart attack at a concert venue in Belgium. He was just 60 years old. Here's to the doctors in the healing world. Here's to the loved ones in their care. Here's to the strangers on the streets tonight. Here's to the lonely everywhere Here's to the wisdom from the mouths of babes Here's to the lions in the cage Here's to the struggles of the silent poor And here's to the closing of the age Here's to you, my little loves Blessings from above, let the day begin Oh, here's to you, my little loves Blessings from above, let the day begin Here's to you, my little loves Blessings from above, let the day begin Here's to you, my little loves Blessings from above, let the day begin Let the day begin, let the day start Robert LeVon Bean has honored his father's songs and the music of The Call in several ways. First, Black Rebel covered Let the Day Begin on their 2013 album Spectre at the Feast, a stunning project that considered grief and loss in light of the absence of the man that the band considered a fourth member. In 2014, the surviving members of The Call gathered with Robert on vocals for a tribute show to Michael. Walking the street Looking for faces that I mean I feel like I, like I wanna go home What do I feel, what do I do I still believe, I still believe I feel the pain, I feel the grief I feel the heartache, I feel the tears and through the years For people like us In places like this We need all the hope That we can't get Oh, I still
Michael Bean and the call were a grace to us. And while I'm certainly glad to know that Michael's legacy lives on through the music of his son, and who knows how many other artists who were directly inspired by his work, he was taken much too young. Thank you, Michael, for your huge heart and huge voice. Thank you, Tom, Jim, and Scott, for your commitment to those big songs. The world is a lovelier place because of your offerings. And to Robert Levon and the rest of the Bean family, grace and peace, know that we will not forget Michael. Listening back to this conversation and this music has got me thinking about something. Many people talk about spiritual deconstruction these days. Millions of Christians confronted with any number of issues related to the modern Christian culture feel compelled to leave the church, analyze their assumptions, and reconsider their beliefs. After tearing the pillars and walls of their beliefs down, they then reconstruct a new spiritual house to live in, unless they don't. But describing this process as deconstruction and reconstruction has become quite popular in some quarters and quite troubling in others. As I listen back to the music of The Call, I am increasingly thankful that I grew up with spiritual leaders, both in person and from afar, who encouraged the kind of constant self-analysis, critique, and adjustment that has allowed for thousands of small adjustments instead of waiting for one major cataclysmic shift. In their early days, Bean's faith, and what I would call a very serious read on the mission and purpose of discipleship, caused him to speak out boldly, even brashly, on political issues he felt the church was on the wrong side of. As he grew, though his convictions about those issues did not change, he came to understand that the deeper rift, the harder problem to solve, was the heart problem happening within so many people, people he still claimed as his people, by the way, who claimed to believe in Jesus and yet refused to take many of his messages seriously. So he turned his lens in on his own heart, his own dents and scratches, and the fear and damage that was fracturing his ability to listen, to hear, to love. This is the kind of bar Michael Bean and the call set. It made me want to be an artist, yes, but it also inspired me to love better. And that is why we are doing this whole thing here, talking to artists and songwriters and producers to learn and to have our hearts expand as our minds are challenged, not by hearing more and more of what we already know and agree with, but by learning how to listen better. If you dig what you've been hearing here so far at True Tunes, you can thank Michael Bean and artists like him. If this is your first time with us and you feel a tug towards these kinds of conversations, welcome to our rabbit hole. All right, I'm climbing off my soapbox. that is going to do it for this episode of the True Tunes podcast. Before we wrap up, I am very excited to let you know that our next episode will feature a brand new conversation with another of our longtime heroes, another of the spiritual founding fathers around here, Bruce Coburn. I fell in love with poetry before I fell in love with music. I, as soon as I understood that you didn't have to make things rhyme, I started finding poems that I was really moved by. T.S. Eliot, uh, Dylan Thomas, like the first time I read uh, The Hollow Man. It was mind-blowing. That's coming soon, so subscribe today and make sure you are signed up on our email list so you can listen on day one. And right as we finished production on this episode, I got a copy of an amazing book that fans of The Call should definitely seek out. Super fan and friend of the band Noel C. Hahn pulled together origin stories on each member, new interviews with previous members and luminaries like Peter Gabriel, Jim Kerr, and others, and loads of ephemera, old photos, concert tickets, posters, even t-shirts. At over 500 pages in length, this is the definitive book for fans wanting to dive deep and get way behind the scenes with The Call. I'll link to it on the show notes page. Thank you so much for listening. Please take a minute to tell your friends and family about the show. Give us a good review at Apple, and you may be able to rate us on Spotify now if you listen there. I also want to thank my co-producer, Bruce A. Brown, for his TLC with this episode. Amazing work. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks to Bruce Near for some of the great rare call tracks, too. And, of course, thanks to Phil Keggy and Rex Paul for our theme song. You'll find a complete list of all of the songs used on this episode on the show notes page at truetunes.com, as well as links to Vision Trust and more. 
Don't forget to sign up on the email list. Find us on Facebook at True Tunes Now. Join our Patreon circle if you can, or drop us a one-time gift if you're so inclined. Also, please support the artists you love. Buy their music, join their Patreon programs, back their Kickstarter programs, see them when they play in your town. The contents of the podcast are protected by U.S. copyright law and are the intellectual property of Gyroscope Productions, with the exception of songs or clips that are from previously copywritten materials. Everything on this episode is used by permission or under fair use provisions. This program is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Gyroscope Productions can be reached at jjt at truetunes.com or P.O. Box 60401, Nashville, Tennessee 37206. Until next time, this is JJT thanking you for taking time to listen. Peace. We don't know how to thank you. This has certainly been an education as well as a treat. We've enjoyed having you, and we hope to see you at our next course. Wild horses couldn't keep me away. Goodbye. 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 We'll see you when the new course opens.